uh, indulge me, I omitted an announcement earlier in the service, so I'm going to, to make it now with your uh, requesting forgiveness. Um, this coming Saturday is the Faith in Indiana Family's First Convention uh, at North United Methodist Church, 1 to 4 p.m. Faith in Indiana is a statewide multi-faith uh, social justice collective. Uh, UUI has been a member of Faith in Indiana since 2014. They do a lot of really fantastic work advocating for marginalized communities and for people who do not have a voice. And for 2018, they have made it their priority to advocate around issues of uh, economic access, access to health care, access to pre-K, around reducing crime, and uh, finding alternatives to incarceration that target poor people and marginalized communities, and also advocating for our undocumented neighbors and not one uh, dime going to ICE deportations that tear families apart. So it's an important agenda. If you uh, are in sympathy with that agenda, I hope that you will come out to the convention. Senator Donnelly will be there, the mayor will be there, other politicians have been invited and will hopefully be there and uh, we would like them to hear our voice. So uh, the, Helene, who has done amazing work with this campaign, and also Karen, Carol Killen has done great work, and others, but uh, Helene will be at a table in the social hall if you have questions or would like to um, sign up. So thank you for that. So April's uh, theme is healing. And I'm going to do something unwise this Sunday on the topic of healing, which is I'm going to argue with the Buddha. But before I get to my argument with the Buddha, I want to tell a true story. And I share this story with uh, my wife Suzanne's permission. Because one day, about six years ago, uh, Suzanne was heading out the door to her car to go to work. Um, and it was raining, and the ground was very slippery and very muddy, and uh, her foot went out from underneath her and she landed on her ankle wrong and just like that she broke it very very badly and I was still inside the house getting ready for her work and I heard her shout and so I sort of run, ran out to see what was going on and she was on the ground in the rain in the mud she was obviously in terrible pain and I went over to her side and uh, you know it quickly became apparent that she couldn't stand on that leg at all and we're trying to kind of you know, help her get up and figure out how are we going to get her to the house, the car, what are we going to do? Um, and at that moment, a neighbor of ours drove by, and she was driving by in a pickup truck, and she stopped. And she saw we're struggling, and she rolled down the window, and she said, do you need help? And we're kind of like doing this. And with one voice, we both said, no, we're fine. <laughs> F thank you. Thanks. We're, we're good. We're okay. You know. And fortunately, she did not believe us at all, because we clearly were not fine. And uh, she came over and helped us, and we were able to get, get her stabilized while the, the ambulance came. So, so what is this need to be fine? To be fine all the time. It is so culturally ingrained in us to have it together. And sometimes that expresses as an inability to ask for help when we badly need help. Sometimes it is an inability to express emotion when we really need someone to hear our emotion. Uh, boys are taught not to cry, not to admit their fears, not to be vulnerable. Women are allowed to cry, but then they're stereotyped as irrational or over-emotional when they do. Uh, I've heard this ad career advice given to women, never cry at work. And if you have to, like, go hide in the bathroom until you're done, right? That's standard advice. Womanist uh, theologian Elaine Crawford, in her book, uh, Hope in the Holler, talks about the modern myth of the strong black woman that uh, assumes that black women have it together all the time and can bear up under any burden without help. And it's presented as a compliment, but it's actually a trap. Because no one can really bear up under any burden, and no one can be together all the time. Sometimes in life, we're going to go a little bit to pieces. Sometimes we're going to go a lot to pieces. And that brings me to my argument with the Buddha. So there's a Buddhist story of a young mother uh, whose son has died in childbirth. And the mother, the mother is unable to accept that her son has died, and so she's going through her village, and she's carrying the body, and everyone she sees, she asks, do you have medicine? My child is sick. Do you have something that can help them? 
And eventually one of the villagers sort of takes pity on her because it's clear that she's not in, a, in her right state of mind. And she says, go and see the Buddha and the Buddha will help you. So she goes to find the Buddha and she asks, can I have some medicine to make my son well? And the Buddha says, I want you to bring me a mustard seed that you have borrowed from one of the homes in this village. But it has to be a really special mustard seed. It has to come from a home that has never known death. Not the death of a parent, a brother, a sister, a child, a friend. So now the woman goes from hut to hut in the village, and she's asking each person for such a mustard seed, but everywhere she goes, of course, in every home, the people tell her that they can't help her, right? Alas, my brother died two years ago in an accident out in the fields. I can't help you. I'm sorry, my mother died last winter. She led a long and beautiful life, and we miss her terribly. Young woman, I can't help you. My friend was killed in the war. He was the best person I ever knew. And everyone she meets, their life has been touched by death, and they share these stories with her of grief, of loss, of joy and fond memories, true, uh, but of tragic accidents and of the passage of time. And finally, she understands that her story is the human story, and she takes her son and she buries him in the forest, and she rejoins the living. Now, in most of the interpretations that I've read of this story, they treat the woman's healing experience as a sort of intellectual or philosophical awakening. The idea is that the Buddha is helping this woman comprehend that, so that something that she did not comprehend before about impermanence, about death, about the inevitability of everything passing, and he's getting her to a place of intellectual acceptance. Because Buddhism teaches psychological realism. We ought not to want that which is not possible in life. In this case, to be free from loss. To hold on to things forever. Rather than struggle and rail against the reality of change, of impermanence, of death, of loss, we accept these things. Because otherwise we unnecessarily multiply our pain. We have the pain at the loss, and then we have the pain at the unfairness of the loss, that we should experience such a thing. But in accepting it, we find peace. And the Buddha says, as all earthen vessels made by the potter end in being broken, so is the life of mortals. Therefore, the wise do not grieve knowing the terms of the world. And so here is where I'm going to do an unwise thing and respectfully disagree with the Buddha. Because I agree that the spiritually mature person recognizes that life involves loss, that everything ultimately passes, that we are finite, time-bound beings. Good things will pass in and out of our lives. Loved ones will pass in and out of our lives. And a spiritually mature person understands this, accepts this, and knows the terms of the world in the Buddha's wonderful phrase. But I think that the wise person grieves just like the foolish person grieves, just like everybody grieves. I don't think of grief as the opposite of acceptance as it is set up in Buddhism. I think of it as the necessary pathway to acceptance. Grief is part of healing. And so grief is itself part of the terms of the world, and it is our job to accept that grief and to love the world anyway. And sometimes in this process, we go a little bit to pieces. And sometimes for a spell, we fall completely apart. And that is okay. It says nothing about our wisdom and everything about our humanness. So when it comes to grief and loss, I agree with the maxim that the only way out is through. The only way out is through. And I think that there is a corollary to that, which is that getting through is getting through. When you're talking about dealing with significant life-changing loss, when you're in the midst of deep grief or real heartache, you just have to get through it, and it doesn't matter how you get through it. There's no proper way to do it. There's no bonus points for doing it with amazing aplomb 
astonishing dignity and such clarity of mind and temper. If you have a Martha Stewart's Guide to Grief in your hands, if you have the Emily Post of grief, like, throw it away. Because sometimes our pathway through grief is going to knock over a few bottles of wine. And it's going to involve upteen viewings of Bridget Jones' diary. Or it's going to mean screaming into a pillow so the kids and the dogs are not frightened. Uh, I know a woman who got through her divorce by going down into her basement, and she carefully laid out like heavy tarps all over the floor. She put on her protective goggles, and she threw plates at the wall, smashing them to bits, one after the other. And it was like a spiritual practice for her, and it got her through. Getting through is getting through. And you're allowed to fall to pieces a little bit while you're doing it. And getting through takes as long as it takes, sometimes longer than we think it should. Sometimes we are sad or angry for longer than our socially set internal clock tells us is the right amount of time. Sometimes our partners or our neighbors will helpfully suggest that you should be through this by now, and you're not. And that's fine because it takes as long as it takes. And sometimes grief is not ever really going to weigh, and what we are actually learning is how to manage it. This might be the case with the loss of a child or the loss of a partner. We are never going to walk past our grief, so instead we are learning to walk with our grief in a way that still honors the living and life's potential. And it's important to say in this that sometimes grief can be so overwhelming or so destabilizing uh, that it can be dangerous to our well-being or the well-being of our household, right? It can threaten our employment or tip over into substance abuse or depression. And there are prejudices in our society against saying, uh, this is more than I can handle and I need mental health care. I'm falling apart more than I can handle. And some subcultures have very strong prejudices against this admission, but there's nothing wrong with needing help with dealing with our grief, and that includes needing professional help with dealing with our grief. And sadly, and I would say infuriatingly, these resources can be very hard to come by. We do a shockingly bad job of making mental health care available to the people who need it. I believe we should all be advocating for that, better mental health care. And we should support people in seeking it when they need it. And we should do what we can to remove the stigma by talking about it and getting it when we need it. So let's return to our story of the woman and the mustard seed. Uh, and understand, I'm not an expert on Buddhism, so I'm not claiming that I'm going to give like the correct Buddhist interpretation of the story. So this is more like a UU exploration of a Buddhist story. It's like UU Midrash of a Buddhist story. So in my reading of the story, what is keeping the woman trapped is not her grief. It's not that she is grieving, but in fact it's that she is unable to grieve. Because in this case, her grief is so overwhelming that she shuts it down completely. She goes into denial. And what she needs to do is feel her grief, even if it means that for a while she will not be okay. She will not be fine. She will need help, and she needs to go to that place, but she can't. So I think this is actually the story of a woman who is unable to grieve, who is then enabled to grieve, and is then enabled to heal. But the grieving and the healing takes place off camera, as it were. It happens off stage, and that's my a bone to pick with the Buddha, that the grieving and the healing happens off stage. We're going to talk about where I think it happens. So first, let's remember that this is a parable. It's a story that's meant to evoke universal experience, so we understand the child in the story as a metaphor for any loss or change that we're not able to accept or process. And it could mean the loss of a loved one, something that is going to touch all of us at one point. But it could also mean we're going through a divorce or the end of a romantic relationship that we did not want to end. We might have lost a job and be experiencing an identity issue around that. We might be experiencing a decline in our health or our physical or mental powers. We can't do the things we've always been able to do. And so we're entering a season of dependency 
that is coming faster than we want it to. Also note that loss can coexist with good things. We might be making a career change, but fully embracing the new opportunity means grieving the career that we are leaving behind. We might be excited about moving to a new home or to a new state, while also grieving the loss of the old home or the old friends. Right? So allowing ourselves to feel that grief can be part of fully embracing the new possibilities in front of us. So when the young woman in the story is wandering throughout the village, carrying her child to people and asking them to heal him, when she's first just in that state, the people around her can't talk to her. They can't connect with her because she's not in reality. And they feel pity for her as opposed to compassion because pity is a feeling that we have when we can't see ourselves in other people. So in the beginning of the story, the image that I have of this woman is that she's very isolated. She's, she's turned so inward that she is isolated from her community. And even surrounded by all of these people, she is alone, fixated on what she can't accept. And so I think what is very important to the story and in what the Buddha does for her that is not stressed in the interpretations that I read is that as she follows the Buddha's advice, as she goes to these houses and asks, have you experienced death? She's reconnecting to people because the Buddha has her seeking out and listening to their stories. Not her story, but their story. Has anyone died in this house? Yes, I also lost someone, my father, several years ago. And I picture this woman, you know, she's sort of mechanically asking this question, because of course she's really fixated on what she needs, which is this mustard seed. But as more and more people tell her their stories, I can see her sort of slowly opening up and beginning to hear. Yes, I lost my brother just this summer. I lost my daughter. I loved her so. She was my whole life. And so as she's seeing these people and the pain in their eyes and the trembling in their voice, she understands that they've gone through the same thing that she's going through and there begins to be a connection. And this connection is what gives her a safe place to tell her own story. And so in the intimacy of these strangers' homes, they can all for a moment share their grief together. And what the Buddha is doing is reconnecting her to a community where she can hear and be heard. And suddenly she's not alone with her grief. Tell me about your daughter. I'll tell you about my son. And there is kindness and compassion available to her now rather than pity. And there is love available to her now. And in the supporting embrace of that love, she can do what she could not do before, which is allow herself to really feel her grief, knowing that if she comes undone, she will be held. There's power in that knowledge. There's power in listening and being heard and knowing that if I come undone, I will be held. Someone will be there to hold me. And that is one of the blessings of belonging to a really supportive religious community. That it gives a place to really listen to one another and be there for one another at those moments when it feels like we might be falling to pieces a little bit. That's why we have joys and sorrows and why we have deep listening opportunities like chalice circles. Because there's such power in knowing that we're not alone. Other people are feeling what we're feeling and they've been through what we've been through. And then from a place of shared trust, we can listen to one another. It's one of the great gifts that we give one another as we deal with life's impermanence. We don't need to try to fix things for one another. We don't need to have a solution. We don't have to make it better. We probably can't make it better, but we can just listen. We can just be there. And that is one of the ways that we can be healers for one another. As the Reverend Mark Bellatini said in our reading, do not think you can take away each other's troubles, but try to be with each other in them. Remember that you are part, not all, Great, but not by far the greatest. Precious, brief breaths in the great whirlwind of creation. 
It's the paradox of religious community that we are made strong precisely because we are given permission to be fragile. We are made courageous because we are given permission to be vulnerable. We are made whole because we are allowed to be broken. May this house of joy and sorrow be a place where we can bring our great gladness and our grief. And may we find here in this place a place of healing. Blessed be and amen. Our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is number 128 for all that is our life. Please rise and body your spirit. <clears throat>